I'm Dr. Mark Atala, and I want to welcome you to my office. I'm a cognitive scientist who studies time travel and retrocausality, which is how the future impacts the present and the past. And what I want to talk about today is intelligence. Now, intelligence and intelligence testing has been controversial since Alfred Binet and Theodore Simon first came up uh, or came up with the first intelligence tests. Um, their intention was to uh, test Paris school children and determine what they called their mental level because they wanted to identify children who would be helped by um, more contact with their teacher. They were vehemently opposed to the idea of mental age, which was proposed by Wilhelm Stern, uh, a German psychometrician in 1911, because they thought that reducing intelligence to a number was misleading and potentially dangerous. But that's what we talk about now when we talk about IQ. So what is IQ? Uh, well, I'll talk about how it's measured. So the average IQ is 100. Uh, so tests are standardized to have a 100 IQ. And uh, it has a standard deviation of 15, which means that um, basically if you score a 130 or above, then you're in the gifted range because there's two, two standard deviations above the mean. And if you score 70 or below, you are borderline um, mentally impaired because you score two standard deviations below the mean. Um, yeah. And so uh, it was uh, intelligence took, testing really took off in the United States after uh, uh, or, and during World War I because of what were called the Army Alpha and Beta tests. But it was um, what people thought at the time was that children who were precociously intelligent would go on to become murderers, basically. Uh, it was called Early Ripe, Early Rot. And the um, poster boys for this were Leopold and Loeb, who were two precociously intelligent college students in the 1920s who decided that they were going to commit the perfect uh, crime, they were going to murder uh, somebody. Uh, they didn't get away with it, even though they had Clarence Darrow as their attorney. But it was Lewis Terman who really does the first longitudinal study uh, of intelligence with children. And in 1916, he takes the uh, Benet Simon scales and he re standardizes them for American children. Uh, he creates the Stanford Benet. And we're now in the fifth iteration of that. And I'll talk about that in a little bit here, too. So uh, what he does is what uh, Terman and his group do is they give the Stanford Binet to 250,000 children in California. And they identify 800 boys and 600 girls, uh, a little over that, but uh, who scored, um, uh, they had an average IQ of 151, which is three standard deviations above the mean. And they had an average age of 11. Uh, one of the things they did notice, though, is that they were they tended to be early readers, meaning that they started reading uh, between the ages of three and four. Which really, we're going to come back to this question too: Are er, do early readers become intelligent people, or are intelligent people early readers? So it's a causal versus retrocausal kind of question. So this is a longitudinal study, which means they studied these children over decades. And some of the findings were really interesting. So for example, in a time when only 6% of um, Americans went to college, over 80% of the men and the women went to college. They also took on professional, what are called cognitively demanding jobs. And um, they had lower incidences of things like divorce, um, mental illness, uh, and a host of other um, uh, negative outcomes. And so this idea of early ripe, early rot um, was essentially put to bed. Now, the, uh, a problem with intelligence tests is that people keep getting smarter. And this is what's known as the Flynn effect. Uh, because your opinions on whether people are getting smarter or not may be uh, influenced by whether you work uh, in the service industry or uh, whether you drive a car or any of a host of other things. But uh, this comes from James Flynn, who in the 1980s 
was doing studies with children and then adults too. Uh, he would give them the Wexler intelligence test and um, they would score uh, average on it. And then he would give them the earlier version of the Wexler because again, they keep on updating these tests and re-standardizing them. And what he found was that the children did better on the earlier version of the test, which shouldn't happen. Uh, on the WACE, which is the adult version of the Wexler, uh, he found that adults averaged a um, 103 IQ on the most recent version. But if they took the previous version of it, they averaged 111. So they were smarter on the earlier version, which would suggest that people are getting smarter. Now, if you, if you look at this in something like the Stanford Binet, if you take a child from today with a 100 IQ and given the Stanford Binet from 1932, they, their intelligence or their IQ is a 124. So they do much better on the 1932 test. Conversely, if you take a child who's average 100 IQ in 1932 and give them the Stanford Binet 5, which we have today, they score a 74. So what is going on here? That's what the Flynn effect is all about. And so there are several uh, explanations for it, but I want to talk about Flynn's um, and uh, another cognitive sci or psychologist, Ulrich Neisser, their theories too. Um, the theories that explain it now are things like everything's better now. So uh, nutrition's better, parenting is better, uh, you can debate that one. Um, there's fewer parasitic infections, diseases less, and there's universal education. Although their uh, uh, high school education has been universal in the United States since the 1930s, or all of the above. Uh, and so, but those aren't, I don't think those are very satisfying explanations. Um, James Flynn himself believes that people in the past thought more concretely than they do today, and that their jobs were not very cognitively demanding. And uh, he has a great TED talk about this, which I would encourage you to watch. But uh, he bases this on interviews with Russian peasants from the early 1900s. And they're asked questions like, what do a crow and a trout have in common? And the people, the, the Russian peasants in 1900 said, they don't have anything in common. That one's a fish and the other one's a bird. One lives in the water and the other flies around in the air. So they don't have anything in common. And so Flynn would say they, they lacked um, abstract thought, that that was essentially, that's the big change, that people have been uh, gotten much better at that over time. Ulrich Neisser, who's also a cognitive psychologist, um, I think also has a great idea. He thinks that it's essentially a type of visual intelligence that uh, he calls it visual analysis. That essentially people have gone from pictures on the wall to movies to um, televisions to video games. And so that uh, people for today are more intelligent in a different way than p their grandparents and great grandparents. But I think the, the main problem with both of these is that they, uh, the, I think it's the retrocausal explanation uh, that makes the most sense to me. So let's go back to the Terman uh, longitudinal study again. So you have children who are very intelligent who go into cognitively demanding tasks uh, or jobs that require, um, that are cognitively demanding. Now that's the causal argument. You're smart in the past, and so you go into a job which requires a lot of thought in the future. But the retrocausal argument would be that um, going into a cognitively demanding task in the future requires you to be intelligent in the past. And so, for example, the uh, Russian peasants from 1900, in, by 1920, they'd be on a collective farm. So therefore, they didn't need to be um, actually, it would probably be detrimental for them to be intelligent uh, in the future because they'd be sent to a, a gulag in Siberia. It's the, the cognitive demanding jobs of the future which drive people to be intelligent as children. And so um, 
Uh, so it's their future cognitive needs which determine their intelligence in the past. That's the retrocausal explanation. And this idea of cognitively demanding jobs, I think, is best illustrated through the UT-1 Ultra Trencher, which is a 60-ton, um, essentially, it digs under the sea floor and lays things like, um, um, like oil pipelines and telecommunications cables. So what we've gone from is uh, that there are no cognitively uh, demanding jobs, or there are no, um, only 3% of jobs were cognitively demanding in 1900, and now they're all cognitively demanding. Because we've gone from uh, being able to dig with a shovel to using a machine to dig, to now we have a remote controlled undersea trencher that you need to um, use in order to dig trenches. And so basically, um, in the future, jobs are gonna be, are, you have to be smart in the future to work at a job. And so therefore, people are becoming more intelligent because the jobs are having higher cognitive requirements. So that intelligence, properly understood, is a retrocausal phenomenon. Now, if you think these ideas are interesting, I would encourage you to pick up my book, Psychology and Retrocausality. I would also encourage you to visit us on the web at retrocausality.org because we're trying to identify people who are retrocausally sensitive. If you'd like to support my research, I have a link below to my Patreon account. Otherwise, if you could like and subscribe and share this video, I would appreciate that. Otherwise, I will see you in the future and have a great day.